Hello everybody, Root Beer here. Uh, I thought I'd start a, another series of contest videos. We're going to be looking at the, the Euclid papers. Uh, so as I think I remarked when I talked about Pascal's and Gauss's, uh, these contests have been around for a while, so I'm specifically starting at the year 2000 and progressing forwards towards the present day. Um, you know, the contests, in particular the Euclid, is very old, and I don't think we have anything to particularly learn from an, a 1980 Euclid. Um, just because the contests have changed, the types of questions have become more refined. Now, if there's demand and if eventually I have time, if I run out of present-day Euclids, maybe I'll go back and do them. But uh, for now, we're starting at 2000 and we're progressing, progressing on. And in the year 2000, the Euclid was uh, almost unique. Uh, nowadays, we have the, the Friar, Galois, and Hypatia contests, which are written style contests. You have to prove things. You have to justify things. Uh, but these have only been around since 2003. Uh, so back in 2000, if you wanted a written contest, you had to go to the Euclid or the Descartes paper. And uh, the Descartes has been discontinued, which is why currently I have no plans to go through any Descartes papers. So uh, the Euclid is, is really all that we're going to look at from 2000 that has uh, written style answers. So uh, this is in contrast to the Pascal, Cayley format, and even the grade 7 and 8 Gausses, which were just multiple choices. So I'm going to be writing out every single question and, uh, and giving sort of full style solutions in order to get the full marks on, on every single question that we're going to see in this Euclid paper. Even though not every question on the Euclid demands a written solution. That's uh, something that uh, it differ, in some way it differs from the Friar Galois Hypatia where everything is written uh, for the most part. Actually, no, is that true? I think nowadays the the Friar Galois and Hypatia are also they do they do also have some final answer questions. So, uh, but the style of the Euclid is very much here are some final answer A Bs and then there's the Cs and Ds that are, are written and you actually have to justify everything. But I'm going to be writing out and justifying everything just like I do on the multiple choice contest. So I think this preamble has gone long long enough. Uh, basically, we're starting off the Euclid 2000 paper and we're gonna keep going with some Euclids. How about we actually uh, see the paper? All right, so the Euclid contest. Some of you might be writing the Euclid because, as far as I know, it's still around uh, as of... It's definitely still around as of the time of recording. Whether or not you're watching this in the future is your business, not mine. So it's aimed at the grade 12 level, uh, in contrast to, say, the Descartes paper, which was just aimed at the senior level. Younger grades can absolutely write it, and if you are looking for scholarships, uh, it's a good idea to write the Euclid. And if you are thinking forward and ahead in terms of your university future, it might be a good idea to write the Euclid in grade 9 and grade 10, just to, so you know what you're up against. And that's also another reason why uh, you might want to watch these videos. So this particular Euclid is from the year 2000. Euclids, in contrast to the, the Pascal Kaling Fermat, which at the time were one hour, I guess they still are, this contest was two and a half hours. Calculators were allowed. Some of the questions were short answer, some of them were full solution, okay? Light bulb means short answer, uh, pen to paper means full solution. So uh, you do really need to justify everything in order to get full marks, and uh, in, especially with questions 8, 9, and 10, um, which are the more difficult questions and almost always purely written questions, uh, you are also a little bit judged on how elegant your solution is. It's not a crucial thing, but it, it can mean the difference between a, a 95 on the paper and a 94, that sort of stuff. Uh, but most people don't need to worry about that. So, yeah, like I said, two and a half hours. So if you're, if you're going to go to the uh, uh, CEMC website, which you can find a link for in the description, and you want to practice Euclid's because you, you want to try for scholarships and you want to try for this contest that's coming up at school, uh, a good thing to do is to practice it with the two and a half hour time condition. Or uh, something that you can do if you really want to, Practice it with just, and only give yourself uh, two hours. That way, the actual day of the contest, you get two and a half hours, you, you get a little more extra time than you anticipate. But uh, I'm not going to dictate to you how you should be practicing these contests. In fact, I've, I've spoken way too much. Let's just see question number one. It's a three-part question. These first two questions have the light bulb, so we just need a final answer. And part C is going to be a written style. So we need to talk things out, justify what we're, we're talking about, and actually give explanation and proof. So, 1A. 
if x plus 27 to the 1 one third equals 125 to the 1 third, what is the value of x? Okay. So uh, we could just grab our calculator and work this out, but uh, one also might notice, hey, 27 and 125, these are very special numbers. They're cubes. 27 is 3 to the power of 3, and 125 is 5 to the power of 3. So, uh, x plus 27 to the 1 third equals 125 to the 1 third. Well, that's the same as saying x to the x plus 3 cubed to the 1 third is equal to 5 cubed to the 1 third. Now this 1 you know, third and this 3, well, they'll, they'll cancel each other out because uh, when you have an exponent inside the bracket and an exponent outside the bracket, we can multiply them together. So 3 times 1 third, 5 to the power of 3 times 1 third. So this is 3 to the 1, 5 to the 1, which is the same as 3 and 5. So x plus 3 equals 5. I'm not even going to bother to rearrange that. This is one you should be able to do in your head. x equals 2. All right, and I believe, uh, if memory serves, because it's been a while since I actually wrote a Euclid, they do give you a little box provided to, to write your final answer, and uh, that's all that they really look at. Now, if you uh, mess up this question, if you write in x equals 3 or something, they will take a look at any work you provide for light bulb questions, but you don't need to provide any work if you are, you don't need to show your work if you're very confident that x equals 2 is your final answer. So, uh, writing things for the light bulb questions just for part minus. Now, on to question B. The line y equals x, uh, ax plus c is parallel to the y, line y equals 2x and passes through the point 1, 5. What is the value of c? Okay, so y equals ax plus c is parallel to y equals 2x. Well, if they're parallel, they have the same slope. And that means that a is also going to be 2. Okay, same slope. Slope is the number you multiply x by, because this is the y equals mx plus b form. Okay. So y is equal to 2x plus c. Now, if we want to figure out what c is, we need at least one other piece of information. We had one piece of information that, told, that allowed us to figure out what a is. But to figure out c, we're going to sub in the point they give us, which I believe is 1, 5. Let's just double check that. Passes through the point 1, 5. So if I plug in x equals 1, y equals 5 to this line, it should be true. So 5 is equal to 2 times 1 plus c. So that's 2 plus c. And that's very similar to this first one up here. 5 equals 2 plus c. You should be able to figure out right away c is equal to 3. Okay. And that's all we're asked for that question. We're just asked, what is the value of c? So nice, easy, low-ball questions. This first one could have been done, done with a calculator. And the second comes from work that you see in, in 8th or ninth grade. Just the uh, usual mx plus b form of the line. Okay. So now on to the last part of question number 1c, and we need to write out and justify our solutions. The parabola with equation y equals x minus 2 squared minus 16 has its vertex at a and intersects at the x-axis as at b as shown. Okay. Now there are two x-intercepts for this parabola, but b is the one as shown. It's the, going to be the one that has uh, positive x-coordinates. Okay. Or it's going to be the one that has the greatest x-coordinates because it's further to the right. That's a better way to put it, probably. Determine the equation for the line passing through a and b. Okay. Now they say the equation. There's probably a couple uh, different. I mean, there's there's several different forms uh, of a line but they're probably referring to y equals mx plus b. That said, I don't think you'd be penalized if you put it in standard form or x-intercept form, or whatever you want to do. So, what have we got to do? Well, the first thing we should probably do is figure out the coordinates for a and for b. 
Now, fortunately, we know A is the vertex of the parabola, and our parabola is conveniently written in vertex form. So A being the vertex, it must be at the point, okay, well, where does, where does this become uh, 0? It's going to be at 2, x equals 2, and then negative 16, okay? So now we know what A is. What's B? So by the picture, uh, B is the... x-intercept with the greatest x-coordinate. And we can tell that because on the picture, b is the rightmost, so it's going to have the, the largest x-coordinate. Okay. So since B is an, uh, 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 an x-intercept, we know B is going to have a y-coordinate of 0, and it's going to solve this equation. But we can rearrange that. We can bring the 16 over to the other side. And then we can say, OK, well, plus or minus the square root of 16, that's going to be x minus 2. But square root of 16, this is a number we should know. It's 4, so plus or minus 4 is the same as x minus 2. So the x-intercept of b is going to be either uh, 4 plus 2 or negative 4 plus 2. Just bringing this 2 over to the other side. So 6 or negative 2. And we want to take the, the greatest one, so b is at the point 0, 6. Okay. Now we want the line between A and B. So let's skip over to the next page. So uh, we want to figure out the slope. Well, the slope is the rise over the run. So it's the uh, y-coordinate of B, which is 0 minus the y-coordinate of a, which is negative 16, over the y-coordinate, uh, the x-coordinate of b, remember we have to keep the order the same, minus the x-coordinate of a, which is 2. So 0 minus negative 16, that's just a positive 16. Four minus two, or 6 minus 2 is 4. 16 divided by 4 is 4. Okay. So we have y equals 4x plus b. And just like in uh, question, in, in part B, all we need is an additional piece of information. We need one of the points on the line. Now, A is on the line, so uh, that means that negative 16 is 4 times, well, what's the x-coordinate of A? 2 plus B. So that's 8 plus b. And this one's a little trickier, but we can still rearrange and get b is equal to 8 plus 16, which is 24. So 4x minus, uh, sorry. Oops. I rearranged that wrong. I apologize. Should be minus 24. I did it in my head, but I didn't write it out. That's why I have a minus 24 down here. Uh, so negative 16 minus 8, negative 24. Okay. So y equals 4x minus 24. This should be our answer. Okay. Uh, now what we could do is we could just leave it at that, or we could double check for ourselves. Now, because we used a to define it, we know a is going to be on the line. So we check that b is on the line. Uh, y equals, what's the x-coordinate of b? It's 6. 
So 4 times 6 is 24. Minus 24 equals 0. So that works out. We did check it, but here is our final answer. Y equals 4x minus 24. And we showed our work. We figured out what uh, uh, A and B were in terms of their coordinates. For B, we had to look at the picture. And then uh, standard finding a line between two points, figure out the slope. And then we uh, used one of the points to figure out the uh, y-intercept. So there we go. That's question number one on the 2000 Euclid. I think we're off to a great start. We'll take a look at question number two, uh, which appears to involve a hexagon, in the very next video. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll uh, see you for the next question.